send. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to friends and colleagues from around the world. Welcome to this thematic forum that looks at performance-based standards for infrastructure resilience. Whenever we think about applying resilience knowledge to infrastructure practice, we need to consider several dimensions. For example, capital investment, stakeholder engagement, as well as technology. Standards offer opportunities to bring these different dimensions together. <clears throat> this session will look at the different initiatives that standard setting organizations have taken, and especially look at performance based standards for improving the resilience of infrastructure. It is my pleasure to invite the moderator of the session, Professor John Dora. Professor John Dora is the director of Climate Sense. He has more than four decades of experience across climate change adaptation standards and sustainable infrastructure. He has advised several multilateral organizations, such as the UN and the World Bank. In 2019, Professor Dora was awarded the BSI Award for development of the ISO 14090 standards. This is the first global standard on adaptation to climate change. He is also the recipient of the Civil Engineers Infrastructure Asset Management Prize. Over to you, Professor Dora. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. It's um a fairly intense session that we're going to go through just now over the next hour and a half, looking at transitioning the path to resilient infrastructure through performance-based standards. We've got four presenters, a keynote and three presentations to look at topics such as the benefits for resilient services, examples of resilient services and the use of standards, standards role in recovery and reconstruction, barriers and opportunities in low and middle income countries, transition to net zero, the opportunities the transition to net zero offers to build in disaster resilience as we construct new infrastructure and refit existing infrastructure. And then we have a panel discussion and an opportunity for one or two questions through the chat from, from the audience. So may I first of all introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Kihara, Takehiro, who's the chair of ISO's Committee for Smart Community Infrastructures in um, ISO TC268. Takehiro Kihara is the chief architect in the chief architect's office in the technology strategy team at Hitachi. He's been active in international standardization in the field of smart cities for more than 10 years. He's currently the chair of TC268 SC1 Smart Community Infrastructure, as well as the convener of its working group on disaster risk reduction. Kehara graduated with master's degrees in electric, electronic and computer engineering, as well as business administration. And he's a member of the City Planning Institute of Japan. For our keynote, Mr. Kehara, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor John, uh, for your kind introduction. 
Uh, I would like to uh, start with, uh, not limited to the resilience, but the uh, uh, the basic attitude of our ISO committee toward the uh, uh, infrastructure and the uh, performance-based standard on that. So, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, I would like to ask me to ask uh, the you know organizer side to share my slides uh, for my keynote speech. Oh, thank you very much. This is the one. Okay, uh, again, uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, me to here. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. And uh, today, uh, as I as to, you know, to setting the scene uh, of uh, following good discussion, I would like to provide some introductory thoughts. It's a kind of food for thoughts uh, for the, you know, the role of international standard in uh, community infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So first of all, why infrastructure is important? I think uh, this is a you know obvious question, but uh, uh, first of all, many cities are facing uh, uh, different type of and various type of issues, including um, poverty, crime, pollution, public hygiene, and vulnerability to disaster, of course. And also, cities and the communities need to adapt to a climate change in these days, as you know. And uh, there are arguably, but uh, it is uh, it would be reasonable to say that the fundamental community infrastructures, including energy, water transportation, the waste management, and ICT, these kind of things are essential to support our current lives, well-being, and also the communities, and also to achieve economic growth of the cities and the communities that, uh, in the long run, lead to solve more societal um, issues like uh, poverty. Next slide, please. So infrastructure is important for cities and communities. The next, the infrastructure as a system of systems. ISO TC2661 takes this approach. City community infrastructure is not standalone. They are interconnected and interdependent. For example, uh, the water system, civil water system, or uh, you know, train systems, all uses electricity. And also power plants uses uh, road transport for the fuels and uh, you know, uh, the commutation of the operators and so on and so on. All infrastructure is interconnected. And uh, in this way, the specification to performance of infrastructure should be discussed from a holistic viewpoint. Just only one type of infrastructure is good, but uh, the other, another infrastructure uh, which supports that infrastructure is weak. The total system will shut down in the case of some, you know, disorder or disaster. So um, we need to be holistic. Next slide, please. And uh, the third slide shows some uh, typical role of standards and uh, infrastructure development. Standards triggers creating business ecosystem. As you see here, uh, standards provide uh, the kind of a harmonized protocol and procedure to facilitate the communication, um, trade, and also the, the financing of uh, the you know implementation, the introduction of uh, in necessary infrastructure, uh, infrastructure to cities and the communities. Also, uh, standards can disseminate the best practice in the world and also the state of the art technology to especially you know, uh, developing countries. So uh, harmonization and the dissemination, uh, this is a key word for all standards, as you know. Um, next slide, please. So um, there are some standardization uh, developing organizations in the world, ISO IC, ITUT, ISO IC, GTC1, and so on and so on. However, today I would like to uh, provide some examples uh, from my committee uh, to uh, this floor uh, for the, the food for thought. ISO TC 268 SC1 is dedicated to smart community infrastructures. Um, this is a smart a community infrastructure, not a smart community infrastructure. This is a you know community infrastructure, and that make and uh, we are trying to make it smart. So please go to the next slide. So this is scope. Uh, sorry for some lengthy uh, text, but uh, I would like to uh, you know, focus on the very important point. Okay, uh, our committee is about standardizing the field of smart community infrastructure, including basic concepts 
to define and describe smartness of community infrastructure. Smartness is defined like a one, you know, a performance of a community infrastructure as a whole as an integrated large scale product. As I said before, infrastructure is interconnected and uh, interdependent. So we need to be the you know performance you know uh, assessment should be holistic, and have as metrics for benchmarking, comparison, usage of metrics for the uh, application to the uh, you know diverse types of communities. There are many types of communities like uh, you know industrial city or residential cities uh, and so on, and uh, specifications for measurement, reporting, verification. Of course. And uh, ISO TC 26 one focuses on the technical aspects of a smart community infrastructure, which are basic structures that support the operational activities of urban community, as I explained. As I explained. And the concept of smartness is important. Smartness is addressed in terms of performance relevant to technologically implementable solutions based on much aspects, including sustainability. So we define smartness uh, is a technical performance which support to uh, lead to or uh, contribute to achieving sustainability or other you know, uh, important values, human values, including resilience or adaptation to climate change, those kinds of things. Smartness is a uh, technological performance of holistic infrastructure. Next slide, please. So uh, we've got uh, good participation from the world. Um, actually active participation from 27 countries. And if we include observers, a lot more. Next, please. And this is the organization structure. Uh, I'm chairing the subcommittee one, smart committee infrastructure. This is a technical performance, technical side of infrastructure, which, sub which contributes to the apparent committee, sustainable cities and communities. So TC268 uh, decides some you know, very high level concept and the management system to achieve that. And uh, we are focused on the technical aspect and also infrastructure side as a kind of means or roadmap to achieve that kind of uh, you know, ideal goals. And we have uh, six working groups. Um, actually before we have seven, working three, transportation becomes SC2 now. And uh, under my committee, we have uh, six working groups. And uh, I'm also a convener of working group six, uh, which is dedicated to disaster risk reduction. And today's major topic. However, uh, for, the discussion, uh, for the discussion of this particular session, I would like to introduce three examples of uh, you know, existing standards um, developed in working group one and two. Next slide, please. The first case, the case one is the infrastructure metrics. This is the ISO TS 3751. This is the, uh, this is a uh, standards on infrastructure metrics as a, you know, holistic product system of systems. And it, which is designed to provide a common language to facilitate the communication among multiple stakeholders in terms of the performance of smart community infrastructures. If you have this kind of a standard, the communication of a city and a technical provider, also their financing uh, entity, including in you know, government, a government, a governmental aid, would be much more easier to discuss. Uh, is this, uh, you know, financing would make the infrastructure of this city better, or is this technology works better? Is this technology uh, will this technology make the city situation better? So. If you do not have this kind of a common matrix, you need to first discuss what would be the KPI and the KDI for that product, project. However, uh, this kind of standard will uh, provide us some guide for uh, you know, uh, efficient discussion and the negotiation. Next slide, please. The, this is the, uh, you know, uh, the most uh, you know, salient example of the uh, infrastructure metrics. Unfortunately, I think uh, you cannot find the exact keyword in the table. However, it, it has uh, you know, three categories, three perspectives, 14 needs, and a lot of characteristics. And you can change, uh, choose metrics. And uh, the important thing is uh, you can set, the city can set one, uh, 
metrics or KPI for each category. And you can come up with a nice set of um, performance metrics, performance KPI for the KPI for uh, some negotiation among stakeholders, multiple stakeholders. And actually, this standard has been published in you know, 2015. So the renewal process is ongoing now. Next one, please. And the next up is case two. Once we have you know, KPI, KGI, I think, there should be a roadmap to reach that goals. And uh, this uh, standards provide a, a so-called uh, capacity maturity model, and which decides level one, two, three, four, five, and also defines what the kind of things need to be achieved uh, to advance from level, for example, level one to level two. Uh, this enables cities to implement uh, better infrastructure one by one, step by step. Next one, please. The case three is the integration and interaction framework for smart community infrastructure. This stand, set of standards, actually, which this has uh, three parts. Uh, this set of standards provides a communication protocol among the stakeholders. What kind of discussion points or agenda items uh, needs to be discussed uh, among the stakeholders? This is also facilitate the you know, necessary negotiation and discussion among partners to implement a better infrastructure uh, for cities. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is my final slide to set the scene. Uh, what would be the role of the standard in infrastructure? That is a provide, one is to provide a common language and communication protocol to facilitate the planning implementation and also operation of infrastructure. Second was promote disseminating the best practice and state of the art technology. And third one, they establish a technical interoperability as a basis for community infrastructure as a system of systems. Um, these three points are kind of, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, as a matter of course, uh, most, for most of you. And also I would like to focus on this uh, uh, arguably ideal characteristics that, uh, that uh, standards of infrastructure should have. One is that should be practically useful for practitioners in the field. Second one is science and evidence-based. And third one is the consider measurement reporting and verification. Um, conceptual discussion is really good. And also, you know, beautiful goal setting is also important. However, infrastructure is a technology and also means to achieve uh, human goals. In that uh, sense, uh, the role of uh, standards in infrastructure should be practically implementable and facilitate uh, you know, the field work to implement better and develop better infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope uh, this could uh, set the scene for uh, intriguing discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kara. That was an excellent introduction to our session this morning talking about standards and their benefits and i'll come back to do some summarizing after the the three uh presentations that are coming along i'll just introduce our speakers now before we launch into the presentation first up is dr david Nugent from the uh, tohoku university's international research institute where he's an associate professor and he works in disaster science and as well as a researcher at japan's national research institute for Earth Science and Disaster Prevention. Um, Dr. Nugent originally came from the United States and graduated in civil engineering and urban planning with a PhD. He's a project leader again for TC268 SC1 Working Group 6, which, as we've heard, focuses on smart community infrastructure for disaster risk reduction and his published works on disaster risk reduction and tourism in Asia and Oceania. So that's Dr. Nugent, we have uh, Mr. Sanjay Kumar Nirmal, who's the additional director general in the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways in India, but he's also the, the secretary general of the Indian Roads Congress. He's been associated with the IRC for more than 30 years. He joined the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways for the Government of India through the Engineering Services Examination in 1986. And from 86 to 2017, he's worked in various offices in the ministry in various capacities. He's also worked as the National Highways Authority of India 
during 2003 to 2009 as a general manager and as the chief general manager 2009 and 10. And our third speaker today is Serena Caluccio, who's the executive director of the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, ICSI. She's an experienced civil engineer and infrastructure practitioner with 20 years experience advising governments, infrastructure owners and operators, multilateral development banks and NGOs to develop and implement sustainable and resilient infrastructure that's fit for the future. She was previously head of guidance and standards at the Resilient Shift, as well as an associate director and infrastructure advisor at Arab. She serves as a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers Advisory Board for the Sustainable Resilient Infrastructure Community. So that's uh, a quick introduction to our three speakers. And I'd like, first of all, to introduce Dr. David Nugent um, to talk about service level benchmarks and other detailed parts of infrastructure resilience. Over to you, David. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can the moderator share my slides, please? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so greetings, my name is David Nguyen. I'm associate professor at Tolkien University, and I'm also a project leader in ISO TC 268 SE1 Working Group 6, which focuses on smart community infrastructure for disaster risk reduction. Next slide, please. Disasters occur when natural hazards interact with the community's exposure and vulnerability. We can reduce the impact of these disasters through preventative infrastructure, technology, and disaster education. Next. For example, in Bangladesh, which has been hit by powerful cyclones, we can examine a correlation between the substantial reduction of deaths and the increasing number of cyclone shelters being built. Next. Here in Japan, the 1995 Kobe earthquake caused widespread devastation, with many key buildings damaged, such as government offices, fire stations, etc. However, in 2011, a more powerful earthquake hit Sendai, but the city learned the lessons from 1995 and began retrofitting many of the buildings for earthquakes, such as government buildings, fire stations, and schools. As a result, government offices and fire stations suffered no major damages and were ready to respond right after the disaster. In addition, no school children died at their school. Next. I'd like to introduce our standardization activities in our working group. We have two ongoing projects. The first is a technical report we examines existing and planned smart infrastructure for disaster risk reduction in the world. The second is an international standard based on this report that focuses on guidelines for the implementation of seismometers. We are also considering the development of standards on disaster risk finance, disaster food, disaster tourism, among many others. Okay, next. In regards to our technical report, we've identified planned and existing smart infrastructures uh, for disaster risk reduction in the world. Many of our examples come from countries with significant disaster experiences. For example, earthquakes in Turkey and Japan, wildfires in Australia, volcanic activity in Colombia, German floods, and et cetera. And from there, we've analyzed what common infrastructures exist, what's missing, and areas for future standardization activities. Okay, next. Here's a sample of our technical report. As you can see, many of the global examples in our survey focused on hydrometeorological hazards, such as floods and tropical cyclones. However, geological hazards, such as earthquakes and tsunamis, were also common responses. Next. Many of our survey examples focused on transportation and ICT infrastructure. However, we do have several examples that are, that are multi-infrastructure based due to how interlinked uh, many modern structures are. Additionally, many of our examples focused on the pre-disaster phases, but uh, those focusing on the response phase was also quite high. Okay, next slide. So here are some of the examples that were provided. We have seismometers used in high-speed rail in Turkey and Japan, automatic floodgates in Japan. We also have regional examples, such as the tsunami warning system used in several Mediterranean countries. Australia has a digital twin system that monitors all infrastructure in real time, which looks at infrastructure systemically and reduces cascading risk. Colombia has something similar as well. Finally, not all infrastructure must be gray. Germany is using a mixture of blue and green infrastructure alongside gray ones. Okay, next. Based on our technical report, we've identified the following key principles. The first is that inclusivity 
is vital in creating a comprehensive plan that could be supported by a wide range of stakeholders. Next is the total optimization of operations. The harmonization and dissemination of technologies between stakeholders and communities is also important to reduce disaster risk on a broader scale. We also need to promote robustness and redundancy in case of something fails. Now for each disaster phase, we need to understand disaster risk based on accurate scientific information. We need to also focus on the critical functions of infrastructure as well as adopting both structural and non-structural approaches. It's also important to invest in advance because it's actually cheaper than focusing on reconstruction and more importantly, it saves more lives. We need to be ready to respond when a disaster event does hit. And finally, after this disaster event, we need to continuously strive for improvements by building back better and reviewing lessons learned from the previous disaster. Okay, next slide. Next, I'd like to talk about our international standard that we'll be publishing soon. This focuses on guidelines on implementation for seismometers, which can be utilized by community managers, developers, and operators. Next. For example, seismometers can be used in early warning systems for earthquakes or volcanic activity. It can also be used for evacuation purposes. We can also use it to monitor infrastructure health even outside of disaster events. Okay, next slide. So to conclude, rising demographic pressures will inevitably lead to greater demand for smart community infrastructures to manage these pressures. At the same time, more people will become exposed to hazards due to this, uh, immigration into the urban areas. Thus, it is an important opportunity to promote smart community infrastructure that can reduce disaster risk. Our working group standardization activities can help promote this by developing standards based on real world experiences and practicality. Standardization can help, can help reduce costs, time, and labor by promoting greater commonalities. It can also promote the spread of technologies and ideas from communities in the developed economies to developing economies. Next slide. I'd like to show this picture. Which would you rather be? On the left, to invest in, uh, in advance and promote resilient infrastructure, which can save lives, or on the right, which uh, simply invests on reconstruction, but does not care much about uh, human lives. Okay, and the next slide. So if you're interested in more about our activities, you can check out our profile page on the Sendai Voluntary Commitments page, where you can see how our project aligns with the Sendai framework and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, next page. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Newton. <clears throat> Excuse me. We now have a few minutes. For, for our panel to reflect on uh, that presentation on um, disaster risk reduction and, and, and some of the really key points that came out of, of that presentation. Things that I was quite interested in were the sort of prevent and prepare aspects and also the use of um, blue-green infrastructure. But rather than me speak, I'll just open to, to the floor of the panel to see uh, if any reflections from the panel. Who'd like to, to speak first? I I I, ju I just uh, wanted to um, to make a reflection that is uh, relevant to both presentations and, and the standard uh, itself, um, which is uh, introduction of new technologies um, into legacy infrastructure, and the fact that um, that might um, introduce unintended. Uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and I was wondering whether the standard had um, taken this into account. And the, my other, my other um, communities infrastructure is, is a great um, way to call it, you know, because infrastructure is for the community. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the, the standard is quite technical. So the other, the other thing I was wondering, and, and maybe was, you know, like I was not uh, explored in detail in the presentation is how then uh, the community needs have been taken into account, whether it was like through level of service uh, that satisfies the community. David. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so should I take this or Mr. Kihara? Yeah, just, or... If you want to give an initial response, Mr. Kihara, what other uh, comments? Okay, um, thank you very much for the question, um, Sabina. Um, so our current uh, standards that our working group is producing um, the first is a technical report. So that's just kind of like a literature review or survey of what's existing. 
And then the next one is an actual uh, standard, uh, which is on the uh, guidelines of how it should be used. Uh, but for more specific ones, for example, um, you brought up retrofitting. Um, there's another uh, ISO, and as you know, there's a lot of different technical committees, right? And th they do different things. And so for our group, um, the one that we're working on focuses more on like its use cases and how it could be used. Uh, but for like the more um, specific engineering examples, um, there's one called ISO 16711. And that focuses more specifically on retrofitting concrete buildings or for seismic uh, activities. And so in those cases, uh, you can find more information about how it can be done and maybe some possible, because um, they're, they're, like you mentioned, there may be some kind of other effects that we may not uh, have considered. And that kind of leads to um, what some of the principles that I mentioned earlier um, that we derive from our technical report and the importance of having a lot of um, inclusive stakeholder participation uh, because we need all the different members of the community like local governments, businesses, uh, the local communities themselves uh, to be participating in this process of disaster management planning because uh, when more people, when more stakeholders participate, they may feel a sense of ownership and it's easier to reach consensus towards developing some kind of plan. And each plan needs to be tailor-made for each community. And in that sense, our standards, uh, they tend to be generally broad enough so that uh, there's things that different communities or stakeholders uh, can use as guidelines for whatever they're trying to achieve. Like, um, for example, uh, there are some other uh, standards that will recommend, like, you need to have this percentage of resilient buildings, et cetera. And so we give them something broad that they can reach. And then the communities themselves, whoever uses these standards, uh, can find the more specific um, solutions to reaching uh, those numbers or guidelines. Okay, um, maybe I spoke too much. So I'll give Mr. Kiharas a chance. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you very much, David, for your uh, very detailed comments. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid I have much to have to say, but uh, uh, especially the you know inclusion of the community stakeholders, especially uh, ordinary public, including the residents. Uh, in this part, we are really, really be careful. I, we, I, I, I believe, and uh, we need to be really careful uh, not to make the standards too much technical. And uh, we, SC1, has, uh, you know, uh, uh, Periodical communication with uh, uh, kind of uh, you know representatives of standard users, also uh, you know uh, government officials as well as the uh, uh, NGOs uh, who is representing the interests of you know uh, with the public, and we try to make it uh, easy to understand to everyone. And also in the reality of city development, usually the government official will call. Um, the, uh, different stakeholders uh, representing uh, different sectors. And uh, we hope uh, in this community, uh, you know, the community again, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, lower the barrier to, uh, you know, uh, technical specification of the standard ways. Thank you. Excellent. That really brings us on time to, to move into our next um, presentation from Mr. Nirmal from the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways and also from the Indian Roads Con Congress. Mr. Nirmal, over to you. Thank yeah. you. Good morning. So, first of all, I'm thankful to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share the experience in this area with the international audience. So can I have these slides? So in fact, when we are talking about uh, construction of resilient highways for a country like India, I think first of all, it is important to understand the kind of challenges which we have in India. Next slide. So in fact, India is a country which is seventh largest in the area in the world and the second most populous and at the same time, we have the road infrastructure, which is also second largest in the world, 6.2 million road network. So that kind of huge road network which we have. And uh, for 
uh, expressways and national highways, these are the two primary road networks which is uh, Ministry of Road Transport is directly responsible. And they are carrying the huge traffic, entire, almost 40% of the uh, road traffic is taken care of by these two infrastructure and 70% of the uh, goods traffic and uh, freight traffic. So that, that means that it is overstressed, the infrastructure which we have for national highways. It is overstressed. And when we are talking about the kind of contribution it has to the uh, pollution and uh, these gases. So as per ADB study, 13% of these uh, CO2 gases, greenhouse emissions, which is contributed by the transportation sector, out of this 88% is contributed by the road transport alone. So that is the kind of, I mean, uh, problems which we uh, create by our road infrastructure. And when uh, I want to talk about the development of disaster resilient infrastructure, so let me just explain that the kind of variations which we have in the country, we have hilly regions in the northern part and northeastern part. We have coastal region in the southern part and southeast, southwest part. We have a huge desert, hard desert, which is one of the largest uh, in the world. And at the same time, we have plains which are uh, having the rivers as wide as 10 kilometer wide rivers. Just like sea, so those kind of rivers and which every year they are having floods, and uh, so that kind of disasters which we face. So the challenges which we have uh, in the, these reasons, different reasons, that when hilly region, our hills, particularly Himalayas, they are on fragile hills. Construction of roads in these fragile hills is a challenge because they have frequent landslides, avalanches, flash floods, snow failures. So those kind of disasters which we have in our hilly regions. And coastal regions, we have every year almost this, uh, use high intensity rainfall. So that is also causing a lot of problems to our road infrastructure. And uh, then uh, other problems uh, with other, uh, I mean, bridges and this. Then in plains, as I told you, that floods, we have to take care of these floods. They are changing. These uh, mighty rivers are frequently changing courses also. So those kind of disasters which they bring, even the road construction, they washed away. They, I mean, those get washed away. So we have to construct those kind of roads and bridges which take care of all these things. So, and then uh, we have even the desert area where we have extreme temperatures more than 50 degrees centigrade and pavement temperature goes as high as, as 65, 70 degrees centigrade. So the bituminous road which we construct, they get melted and then uh, we have rutting and sowing and cracking. So we have to have the standards which should take care of all these eventuality. If we, I have IRC is responsible for national standards. So the standard which I prepare should take care of the, all these different variations in different climatic zones. Next slide. And apart from that, uh, we have a huge road development program uh, in last two decades. In fact, 2000 onwards, we have constructed uh, as per national highway development program about 38,000 kilometer length of national highways which have been constructed. And in the pipeline, we have another 35,000 kilometer length, which is now we are taking up for next four, five years. So that kind of huge road development program is there. And that there is a huge increase in demand of the construction materials, that soil, then cement, then aggregates is all, mining of aggregates, then bitumen, and all these materials also, there is a huge scarcity. So that sustainable road, if I have to construct, so I have to think of an innovative solutions and alternative technology. And uh, then uh, uh, for creating or, or these highways, I have to uh, motivate them, first of all, to create the technology and then motivate the agencies to adopt those technologies. So these are the real challenges for construction of our standards. Next slide, please. So as the speaker, about the role of international standard ISO and similarly the role of Indian Road Congress. Actually, this is a body, a society, which is 88 year old now. And it is having the members from all the stakeholders from the government, central government, federal governments, state governments. And then we have from the contractors, concessionaires, consultants, academics, research institutions. So all these are members of our uh, Indian Road Congress. and. Uh, at present, we have about 17,000 members which are actively associated in all our feedbacks, preparation of the national standards. So prime objective of IRC is to give the enabling framework 
to the country because road infrastructure uh, we must have the enabling framework for manuals and standards then only they can be implemented so irc is playing an important role through codes and guidelines in promoting use of low carbon technology in fact we have one of the dedicated committee technical committee which is dealing with disaster management and environment issues so that dedicated committee uh, apart from that we have more than 260 standards and guidelines which have come from irc which are catering to the needs of central government ministry of road transport and highways then national highway authority of india then even for rural roads not only for urban roads and expressways and highways we also have for rural roads we are preparing standards so these we are catering to the all kind of uh, roads uh, starting from the rural road to the expressways and in addition to that to promote our uh, i mean standards and our this uh, awareness among the all the readers all the stakeholders we are also publishing the monthly high, indian highways a monthly journal and uh, quarterly journals then highway research journal and highway research book so to them and apart from that we also have a committee which is promoting the new and innovative technologies and accreditation because otherwise uh, for using any new technology in india we need to have some confidence our in our agency and for that purpose we have this uh, committee which is certifying these new technologies which are being used abroad and in india we have to start them through pilot projects so we have an irc another committee and so far next we have come out with about 17 18 standards which are dealing with the disaster management and sustainable technologies and right from using of waste plastic because we are pioneer in using waste plastic in our own construction and that is really very successful one of the technology which is eliminating the waste plastics from our urban area especially then we are also promoting use of cold mix technology that is another low carbon technology through this uh, and our, our all the our hilly states are using this extensively then warmix asphalt is another low carbon technology which is now being used uh, it though it started very i mean they were very skeptic about using this technology but now we are finding that we are able to promote that and they are using it then use of uh, uh, rubbers that waste rubber and then rubberized bitumen in uh, various weaving courses crumb rubber natural rubber so they are also being used in our Uh, road construction even on our highways and uh, important roads then uh, for we are we also have we many standards which are promoting the use of waste materials like construction and demolition waste and recently we have come out with all industrial waste so they are also being used on our highways uh, through this standard and then uh, uh, this uh, flexible pavement particularly we are promoting use of wrap to even to the extent of 70% in our construction of flexible pavement and then cement rated bases and sub bases also they are uh, they are helping us in reducing the requirement of our uh, this uh, aggregates because aggregate are very scarce material and uh, we are promoting those technology which are helping us in reducing their requirement then recycling also is being used extensively on our highways to use the existing pavement then apart from that there are various environment management uh, Roads. We are dealing with tree plantations on rural roads, urban roads, city roads, and environment clearances. Also, we have stringent guidelines to promote the environment. Whenever uh, we cut the tree, we have to promote more than ten times number of trees we have to uh, transplant. So that is how we have to maintain the ecological balance. Also, then on the, when we are talking about the disaster issues, we have recently come out with a guideline on flood disaster mitigations for highway engineers, and this is being now. extensively used by all our uh, i mean state governments and the central government then apart from that installation of gabion structures for controlling floods then uh, we have iron steel and copper slag also now we have started using on our roads and recently because in order to promote them there was a need that how to rate the highways as per green technology so we have come out with the latest guideline on green rating of highways that how to rate the different highways so that i can promote the highway which are more green so this these are some of the codes which are helping us in uh, bringing this disaster resilient construction then next next slide please then in order to this uh, having this technology and promote their use we have to come out with more and more uh, 
innovative materials and that what that is what i told you that we have another committee which is promoting their use through new and innovative materials and technology which may be used might have been used anywhere in the world and even uh, in india we, we may not have any experience even then this particular committee is uh, waiting uh, these new technologies and uh, we are allowing them with precautions in indian conditions then we have also we are promoting the use of construction equipment innovation machinery innovation and uh, these construction procedures innovation uh, through this uh, promoting of these materials through our committee then uh, innovation in pavement and structural evaluation methods also we have come out with many uh, i mean codes and uh, guidelines which are helping us in conserving our resources then road asset management also that is helping us in prioritization of various sections and as i told you green rating of highways is uh, helping government in uh, incentivizing these particular materials next our prime minister also is uh, very keen in promoting innovation and uh, in one of the uh, csd 2017 seminar he, uh, he was defining uh, while releasing book of innovation he said that innovation is no longer remains a choice but has become an imperative and that is where a kind of spirit which not only the road infrastructure ministry but all the all our other uh, ministries power ministry and other railway ministry they are all taking innovation in a big way in the country so as to bring the technology with a i mean cost effective manner not only this uh, technology should be brought but it should be cost effective so in a nutshell when i summarize them next slide then they we have the short term purpose and long term purpose of promoting their use short term purpose for this promoting this disaster resilient structure is to restore the green cover because when we are constructing road many i mean we have we are removing these stop soils and green cover so that we have to see that how do we restore them prevent soil erosion by wind and surface so that we have brought in our guidelines various methods then conserve water because uh, reducing uh, water also is needed and for reducing runoff and increasing infiltration of transportation then improving aesthetics and environment is another way so our some of the codes which are referring to the direct uh, the issues of uh, environment they are addressing these issues when and when we are talking about strategic purpose i mean long term use then for sustainability like i told you that we have a very huge program still constructing another 35000 length of kilometers length of uh, highways to be constructed in next 4 5 years then we have to have the long term strategy also so we have to draw from nature what can be replenished without hampering development and social justice means all the initiatives which have been taken at the international level we are bringing in our codes and standards to promote their sustainability then we also our as our government has uh, given the and the commitment to the global uh, the global forum that our aim is to have net zero emission and we are uh, focusing to the uh, all the issues of the global warming at the government level highest level and then we also have to aim at eliminating the cost imposed on the society even at the project level at the bottom most level so all these uh, our irc codes and standards are helping to achieve these particular aims and but some of the issues which uh, are still challenges for preparation of the codes and standards next slide that first of all identification of those new technologies which can be used to derive the maximum benefit though we are coming out uh, maybe every year with uh, some of the new technology which have been successfully used in india as well as abroad but it is still a challenge to bring more and more such technology which address each and every issue then in addition we have to have the cost effectiveness because many of these uh, innovative and new materials which are coming in india from outside so they are very expensive as compared to the conventional technology so we also have to see that how we promote them how to bring the cost down in our construction so that is another challenge then we at the same time we have to educate and have capacity building of our stakeholders our state government our consultants our contractors they also have to be educated through our uh, i mean awareness program and our trainings so that they also understand the importance of the construction of disaster resilient structure then uh, uh, one of the technology which have been uh, for last 3 4 years we have come <coughs> oh very widely used is the soil stabilization techniques in fact irc codes are there there are many codes so this is being used very extensively even on our expressway now we are using it because we have now such 
gained so much of experience in that soil stabilization. So this is helping in a big way. And uh, then uh, design of mixes and implementation of technical support. These are also issues which uh, we have to have the capacity building and promote them. Then there are cases of non-performance also. And we are asking feedback, frequent feedbacks through our uh, website and through our uh, other stakeholders, through our frequent conferences, so that we address these issues of non-performers and how to improve their performance uh, so that these all the technology which are using are really cost effective and helping to the country in construction of a disaster resilient infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nermal. I've got time for just one observation from our other panelists. If just one comment or observation from one of the other panelists, if, if they want to say anything. But if not, we can move on to Savina's presentation now. Savina, thank you, Mr. Nirmal. Um, we'll come back to discussion on all the panelists' presentations later. But um, Savina, if you could continue with your uh, presentation talking about transitioning to net zero and other disaster resilience issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you for having me today. It's a privilege. If you can, please share my slides. Uh, I will just be giving quick quick thoughts uh, and views on, on how to mainstream resilience and infrastructure as we move towards the net zero future that we're aiming for. So next slide, please. So starting with the what is the need, uh, what is the opportunity and, and what is the urgency? So just just uh, taking those points one by one. So why why is it so difficult? To, to build a case for resilience. Uh, so the, the excellent Lifeline report from the World Bank told us that for every dollar invest, invested, there's a, there could be a return of $4, $4 in benefits. Uh, and there's um, many more examples of um, uh, benefits being evidenced. However, we've got short funding cycles. Uh, we know that our infrastructure, is, there is underinvestment. We know that there are competing demands on limited resources. Also resilience is not enshrined in policy in the same way net zero is. Um, so effort, all of this makes it, makes it difficult to make the case for resilience. And it's also something that uh, sometimes is not felt, felt as pressing if disasters don't occur. However, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, we are already feeling the impacts of climate change, and there is a whole new emphasis uh, from the last since the last COP on limiting loss and damage for those areas where these impacts are already being felt. Um, and resilience, uh, luckily, and this is the great news, is uh, gaining more and more in prominence since the last uh, few COPs. And then uh, uh, the plan the plan is to have the putting resilience adaptation uh, adaptation resilience and mitigation um, on the same on equal footing and that's one of the key themes that is coming up at the next COP so that's great but until we talk about adaptation and mitigation it, as two separate topics I think there is a risk that they will remain siloed and that's kind of something that happens and it is happening unfortunately still. So future infrastructure development should be climate compatible. That's another way to call low carbon resilient um, infrastructure. So in that Venn diagram we've got there, we should just really aim for that sweet spot in the middle of all of those, uh, those uh, circles. Um, and this is an opportunity, an opportunity to, as we move towards net zero, as we intervene, then there is an opportunity to also make uh, those interventions and those changes, those new infrastructures, also re resilient, you know, embedding resilience into it. However, not all net zero interventions are going to result in more resilient infrastructure and vice versa. So there, are, there will be some trade-offs and this is something that needs to be well explained and understood, I think, before we can be firmly in that sweet spot. And then finally, understanding the implications of net zero on, on an existing infrastructure system. So the, the opportunity in building a new infrastructure is clear. You know, we can build a, a low carbon resilient infrastructure if we, if we really want and, and you know put our minds to it however the it's going to be a lot of existing infrastructure that needs to be refurbished retrofitted renewed um, and so therefore it's not going to be always an entire replacement it's going to be a mix of 
um, proactive maintenance, um, adaptive management. So it is a, it's a kind of a mix of strategies and approaches that will be used. So what I would be concerned here is that not all practitioners, uh, and particularly the ones that are in charge of making decisions on what projects and what infrastructure gets built, have an understanding on how certain interventions can have an impact on the overall resilience of the system. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So how do we then mainstream low carbon resilient infrastructure? So uh, we, I think here we really need to focus on equipping practitioners with guidance and tools that would make a difference now. So standards, you know, ISO standards, and you know, they, they are all uh, extremely needed. Um, and but it, they take time, uh, and there is not a lot of time. And we need to start taking action now. So I think um, I think this is this is uh, and another point that I wanted to make is that standards that fully integrate mitigation and adaptation and resilience and clearly explain those trade offs that I mentioned before are still emerging. So they're still being, so for example, the ISO family talking about climate adaptation, ISO family talking about climate mitigation, and we know that we want to, them to be talking to each other, but you know, what's something that fully integrates the two is just not available at the moment, but we don't have the luxury of time to wait. Uh, and so for the policies to trickle down and for, for standards to be fully developed. So I think, you know, what we also need to provide to practitioners is examples of what has worked. So dissemination of best practice, dissemination of um, good guidance. Um, and, and, and I think to mainstream low carbon resilient infrastructure, as uh, uh, it's been mentioned before, we need to be taking a system view, system perspective, but also a life cycle approach. I think, you know, that is something that would help um, integrate the two. Um, but we should not assume that all users of standards know how to do this in practice and, uh, and that they are both mitigation and adaptation literate. So capacity building will be playing a big role here. And the knowledge-based organizations like CDRI or my own organization, um, ICSI, International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, have that key role of providing access to that guidance, to, that, to those tools that already exist, to examples of solutions where it's worked. Um, and, and, and also, I think the community of experts, such as uh, the ones that are convened today, uh, really, I think I also have a role of um, sharing their knowledge, and which is what we're doing today, right? So about being generous with the knowledge that we've got so that this, this um, mainstreaming carbon, low carbon resilient infrastructure can happen more uh, faster. So I, th I think I'll probably stop there because uh, I'd like to leave some, some time for the discussion, but John, over back to you. Thank you so much, Savina, for those sort of um, few principles, few sort of thought-provoking statements there. Um, I'll just open the, the floor to the panel to see if there are any observations or comments or questions of, of Savina on those. We heard about things like um, systems thinking, life cycle thinking, um, decision makers and decision makers knowing what the consequences are. So any comments from, from our other panellists? Got a few minutes for this. Um, I'd like to make a quick comment. Yes, David, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely totally agree with um, Sabina's presentation. And as you can see, the principles that she mentioned at the end of her presentation and the key principles that we brought in, um, or I brought in my presentation, there's a lot of huge overlap, right? Because uh, that's the thing that we really should strive for. One is uh, inclusivity, including the different stakeholders, a more bottom-up uh, approach to planning, um, because uh, we need to look at systemic risk uh, because disasters affect a lot of different infrastructure, affects a lot of different uh, communities and um, different groups of people, um, not just one specific infrastructure or one group of people. So uh, I think it's very important to see how the different users of infrastructures uh, are affected um, by hazards and how they can plan together in order to best optimize the use of these uh, disaster resilient infrastructure. 
Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I'm of one mind with you, David, as well. The points that Sabrina made are really quite key. Um, when, when we were drafting ISO 14,009, the Adaptation to Climate Change Standards, we were very keen to make sure that stakeholder engagement is key to the, the whole pr production of adaptation and resilience measures. But we also had some, some um, sections in the standard about capacity and decision makers. And, and, and the life cycle point that you made, Savina, which I'll come back on to again, um, a decision has a lifespan. You might de decide today to build a new railway or build a new hospital. And all the systems that go into that infrastructure cover a raft of interdependent components. And that decision today might still impact in 100, 200 years' time. So the length of that decision life cycle is quite key to um, understanding how resilience has to be built and redundancy. That word cropped up again. Redundancy is the key to... to um, one of the keys to, to long-term resilience. But I'll, I'll be quiet there. Any other observations from the panel? No, I'll give it, I'll give it a few seconds. So um, I'll just sum up the, the, the keynote and the, and the presentations. I've just been making some notes, adding some to some I prepared before. Um, I think from, from the keynote, there's a few themes that came through all the other presentations, like... Um, the importance of infrastructure, how infrastructure supports the sort of working of the urban, the city environment. It supports infrastructure, supports society. And when I think of infrastructure, I think of things like transport, energy, water, waste, and information communications. Those are sort of five key areas there. Um, and when we think of infrastructure supporting society, these are these. Um, sectors, energy sector, transport and so on, are all interconnected and interdependent. We need to recognise that and be able to make sure the connections between them are resilient. Um, some of the teaching that I do, I pick up on examples from the, um, the Tohoku earthquake, um, tsunami and the impact that had on the global supply chain. There's a factory not far from where I live in, in England, about 50 kilometres away, that produces Honda cars. And they couldn't produce Honda cars because of that tsunami. The global supply chains are long supply chains that will be infected, uh, affected. Um, the systems approach is vital to, to look at how all these interconnected infrastructures support society. Uh, and David, you talked about things like um, looking around to see what good practice is, looking across the globe to see what works in terms of what infrastructure can be built to make things more resilient. And I think that there's a, there's a sort of subsequent need there is what, what have we got in our infrastructure asset stock that's vulnerable just now? Have, have many people actually carried out surveys to say this is resilient? This isn't. And we need to make things more resilient. So a case for resilience needs to be built. You talked as well, as well about Germany looking at blue-green blue green infrastructure. It doesn't have to. Resilience doesn't have to build in... Um, concrete green infrastructure and we can think about sustainability that's quite important as well we don't want to make climate change worse by, by making things more resilient and you had some principles in, in in your presentation about optimizing operations and thinking of redundancy so these are i think the good pointers uh, mr nermo you talked very much as well about um, sustainable infrastructure and the opportunity to build resilience in when we're building this new infrastructure so it's not just a case of um, retrofitting existing infrastructure. If we're building new, we have that tremendous opportunity to um, make that infrastructure resilient if we're thinking of the lifespan, the life cycle. And that kind of links in with Savina's points as well. Um, resilience and making the case for resilience has been a huge challenge because people put things off to, to tomorrow and think about, yeah, we'll deal with that when we deal with it. But you did make that point. The World Bank recognises, I think it's lower middle income countries, that for every dollar invested in the resilience building, there's $4 benefit. So, so what's not to, to like about that? Um, climate compatibility needs to be built in. The net zero mitigation agenda and the adaptation agenda need to be thought of two sides of the same point in many ways. 
Uh, you also mentioned a mix of resilient strategies. No, I, I think a phrase I would use it would be, there's no one size fits all. And decision makers need to know about decision points, interventions they make, and look at the consequences over time. And one way of looking at that is perhaps to use things like adaptation pathways, which we haven't mentioned. But adaptation pathway techniques are quite useful. And there is a standard BS8631 on using adaptation pathways to deal with uncertainty in future climate change. And that's climate change adaptation, which all will be of interest to people who look at disaster resilience. Uh, integrating across systems. Again, Serena, you came back to that, and, and, and capacity building, you came back to that. Decision makers, funders, knowing what capacity they need to make these decisions that might impact over the very long term. Now, there were some detailed points from each of our presentations in the keynote, but some of the standards relevant, relevant uh, parts that I picked up during discussions were things like harmonization, making things similar and consistent, including the metrics. So we have metrics that can be understood across different systems, interoperability across systems or within systems. So things can be changed or modified easily, they're compatible. Uh, best practice and sharing knowledge, standards are great for that. Um, and they bring in a common language. And to get all that working properly, to develop standards, and we, some of us have been quite heavily involved in developing standards, we think about getting interested parties involved, interested parties and stakeholders in terms of inclusivity, to have that sort of bottom-up understanding of what the communities actually need, rather than transmit things from the top down. So integration through that participation. I was going to mention the programme of ISO standards, but I won't. Um, I'll come back to the sustainable word. We need sustainable infrastructure. We need to think both sides of the coin when looking at resilience. We need to think about making things resilient at the same time. How can we do that in a sustainable way? Now, one of the things I was fascinated with is Mr. Nerman's point that the hundreds of standards that the IRC has produced, there are many bodies that produce standards, and the term standard sometimes puts people off. Standards can be anything from a guideline, a technical note, a manual, a document that helps you to, to transfer best practice, transfer that knowledge, share that knowledge. And thinking of sharing that knowledge, one thing I will ask at the end of this sort of summing up of the presentations before we go into some further detailed questions, is if you who are listening to this um, session today would like to get involved because standards don't just happen. People volunteer to get involved to produce them. If you want to get involved in, in, in national standards development or international standards development, then do speak to your national standards body. Um, I work in a number of fields, and one of the things I do is work with the International Standards Organization, ISO. And I look at um, been helping with their adaptation standards and looking at mitigation and adaptation with ISO across a raft of ISO standards. And one thing we realize is that we need more experts to help us draft the documents that can make us respond to this urgent need to tackle climate change, which will reduce or balance out the um, prevalence of disaster risk over time to adapt and make things more resilient. So if you do want to get involved, speak to your national standards body. Uh, if, if you don't know who that is, I'm quite happy to help people with that. So that was me just kind of summarizing the key points from our excellent presentations. I've now got some questions to ask of our panelists. And I'll start off with um, Mr. Kihara. And, and the question I have for Mr. Kihara is, in, in, in your view, how can standards help support policies and practices to bring about more resilient infrastructure? And with that question, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Kahara to answer it, and I'll ask reflections from the others in the panel. Mr. Kahara. Um, thank you very much, Professor. Um, for uh, making the uh, policies uh, more uh, resilient uh, in terms of infrastructure, 
uh, this, what standard can provide is, uh, I think it's uh, two things. One thing is the uh, guideline. And the uh, second one, the guideline the framework uh, for you know, government officials to set the policy. And also the second one is the second rule would be, uh, uh, again, it's a provider best practice. Because the, um, uh, as you know, um, uh, Mr. Nirma introduced the field needs. The needs in the field is totally different from country to country, areas to areas. So uh, too much complicated and the detailed standards would not work. However, you know, setting the framework and uh, listing up uh, very important uh, points or views to be covered, that would be uh, you know, good role of standard. For example, uh, in taking the you know, Sabine's presentations, uh, for example, if the standard says you uh, need to consider at least uh, how to reach the you know, net zero carbon in the future and that kind of things, would help the policymakers to, uh, you know, uh, take a better way than, uh, you know, business as usual. Thank you. Thank you. And any reflections from Mr. Nirmal or, or, or Savina or, or David? I think we, we, I think we kind of covered the common language, the consistency, the inclusive engagement. I think you know that's kind of. Um, uh, points we've uh, we've covered. I mean, I suppose my point was, and I think you, John, you're right when you say standards. Perhaps you know it's open to interpretation. It's not just the ISO standard that takes a long time to produce, um, but it could also be a guideline and and something that can be used now. Which was the sense of urgency that I was trying to communicate in my in my presentation. Excellent. I think. Uh, when we are talking about that, uh, how these standards are promoting policies, uh, because when we construct a road infrastructure, we need huge money and huge investment, and uh, most of them are coming from the government. Mm -hmm. So when we put any money on construction, we need to have a, I mean, a national standard oil policy, which is, uh, I mean, prepared in the best policies, best R and D, and all these uh, stakeholders consultation, so that it doesn't fail normally. So that is what is the, I mean, then only it will bring the confidence, in not only the government or investing agency, but in the users or all the stakeholders. So that is what is the importance, which is standard based. Unless there is a standard, any technology you bring, it is very, very difficult to percolate down and to implement it. So that is why we look for the national standards. And in fact, any government, when they invest money, they always ask for the standards first. So that is how, when we have prepared so many standards, it has helped in percolating these policies. It has helped already our construction of more than 50,000 kilometer length of road network in the last two decades uh, through our standards and manuals and this construction codes. So that is what is the importance of this standard uh, in uh, creating now for in future for resilience in stuff Thank you. David, is there anything to add? Um, I was just thinking of uh, our Honorable Mr. Normal's presentation um, about roads and floodings and actually one of our technical reports, um, which is going to be published hopefully this year, we have kind of several examples around the world about how different cities are managing um, the construction of roads in terms of uh, floodings and other hazards. Um, so this is like kind of one way where um, we can share experiences from one country and with another uh, community uh, and in order to like strengthen each other's uh, level of resiliency. That's good. That's good. D David, I've got a second question now. Can you provide examples or other examples of existing standards that can contribute to resilient infrastructure? Right. Um, so in addition to our um, standards, such as a uh, TR 6030 and ISO 37174. Um, there are a lot of different groups because ISO does standards for pretty much everything. And I think one of the things to consider is like the scale, right? Um, for example, our group tends to look at a more um, either national level or uh, muni like municipal level scale of uh, infrastructure and disaster management. But we also have like other technical committees that produce standards that are more um, more engineering focused or more um, consumer focused. Uh, for example, uh, TC92, 
they do a lot of fire safety engineering and TC21 focuses on like fire alarms. So uh, those are like more like smaller scale um, infrastructure uh, things uh, people can look at um, when it comes to fire safety, while ours would look at more like say wildfires at a more um, regional level. And then uh, in terms of transportation, there's also uh, publications from TC204, which looks at emergency public transport use for emergencies, uh, um, as well as uh, other transportation related uh, infrastructure. So um, there are a lot of different uh, committees with there are different standards that focus on different scales um, of infrastructure that can be used for disaster risk reduction and uh, resiliency. Uh, any reflections on, on that from, from the others? In fact, uh, when we are talking about use, <coughs> that examples of these standards, and some of the examples which I have given, and one of them is very important that we have floods every year in, in most, uh, most of the country. So we have come out with the guideline, first disaster mitigation, detailed guideline, and SOP kind of things. So that immediately, what emergency measures should be taken, what remedial measure, what permanent measures should be taken, all these are stipulated in our standards. So this will be one of the very important guidelines. And then another was on landslide mitigation measures. Though we have earlier also many publications, but this time we have compiled based on the latest uh, failures which we have experienced in the last couple of years and what actions have been taken based on the feedback received, what are the most effective measures which we should take in the landslide mitigation. And then the third one is about the slope failures. So we have already documented all the slope failures and what actions were taken and based on the feedback and based on the successful performance, we have come out with a guideline again with the what are the best practices for slope protections uh, in these uh, particularly hilly stretches. And then one more guideline which has been just under publication is a guideline for disaster resilient green highways in multi-hazard ecosystem. So this is a guideline which is under print and I think will be helpful in all kinds of hazards which we are facing in different parts of the country. So this will be very useful for the big field engineers. Thank you. Any other observations on that? I wanted to bring um, my own um, experience um, of work that I did in Bangladesh uh, with the road authority, so very probably relevant to also what Mr. Nomar is uh, talking about. Um, and it's part of the national, I think, I, I think it's called National Resilience Programme, um, uh, done implemented by UNOPS. Where, and they were looking at um, really setting up an asset management system for the local road uh, agency, LGD. Um, and I think um, asset management frameworks um, and uh, following that sort of structure, because the asset management framework follows the life cycle, provides great opportunities to uh, and great entry points to actually include resilience into it. And so my suggestion uh, as they were developing um, performance measurement and management and level of service, my suggestion was to develop a level of service that was tied to uh, resilient to uh, resilience to flooding. Um, so, and I guess the point I'm trying to make here is like, it's not always uh, developing entirely new guidelines or entirely new standard, but it's also about building on something that is already being used and established, but adapting it and um, adding that kind of resilience uh, and adaptation uh, component, because that will that will be uh, taken up a lot quick more quickly. And, and in the case of the asset management framework, already adopts uh, a life cycle approach. Thank you, Sabina. So I just wondered if any other, Mr. Kahara, anything to add? Um, no, uh, not at this moment. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Um, there, there was one question that came in from, from our delegates, so Mr. Nemo, um and you partially answered it, I think, but are there any other urgent standards in the road sector? That require an immediate review that, that you know of, um, and and the comment was about 
that uh, in view of unprecedented levels of stormwater discharge, intense rainfall, cloudbursts, and other natural disasters. Are there any other standards that um, in the road sector that need reviewed? Sorry, I don't know if it was, was my, my Mr. Nome, I just wonder if there's any other standard that need reviewed in, in, in the road sector in India because of the unprecedented levels of storm water discharge and intense rainfall and cloudbursts. Are there any others that you think should be reviewed? No, it doesn't. I'll, 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 I'll move on to um, Savina. Um, global performance benchmarks, how are these, in your view, often executed? Maybe as certification systems, or, or how are they working as being yes, thank you. bringing about resilient infrastructure? Yes, yeah, so. Um... I think they are uh, qualification, certification and uh, rating systems um, are a great way to promote uh, adoption of climate resilience um, and climate resilient design and other, you know, embedding resilience more broadly in infrastructure. So um, it, it also um, helps achieve that sort of consistency and uh, and also helps in a way to, with the capacity building uh, amongst the practitioners. So um Climate resilience is uh, generally in existing, I'm thinking about existing rating systems and um, and uh, certification. Climate resilience is rarely directly addressed in the requirements. However, some of the rating systems um, already include uh, resilience uh, criteria. Uh, just thinking about, um, just giving a few examples, uh, for example, Envision, uh, that is uh, uh, used um, in, in many in many infrastructure projects, uh, particularly in the US and Canada, and I think North America. Uh, just mention another one is Shore, that also uh, is um, is a rating system certification process, uh, and um, and that also includes some uh, resilience related criteria. Um, SQL, um, and then. Um, I think, you know, the, and the IS uh, rating scheme in Australia, I just don't want to do a disservice to, to you know, not mentioning certain ratings, rating systems, but these are a few account that come to mind. Um, and I um, and I think is uh, they're extremely helpful. One thing I would say is that um, these rating systems that, um, you know, assure that project come in when the project has already been scoped um, and after procurement. So I think whereas the opportunities to embed resilience uh, and uh, low carbon measures actually come before that point. So yeah, I, I, would, I would just uh, argue that um, we need to uh, and, uh, extend I suppose you know the criteria that then are, be, are going to be used then for to certify the design the construction uh, of the project but you know kind of extend them upstream to ensure that actually the projects that get um, scoped chosen and scoped also include uh, resilience and um, adaptation and mitigation in scope. Great thank you. Um, reflections from Kihara, David, Mr. Nima. Sorry, can I just interrupt? Uh, you know, I think you asked about the benchmarks about the disaster, and I just missed that uh, one. Can I just reflect on that? Please, yes, yes. Okay. In fact, uh, when we are talking about these uh, benchmarks for disaster resilience, I think the most important thing is our own experience. In fact, uh, one of the disasters is cyclone, and which is every year we are facing in one of the coastal states in India, that is Odisha. And there, not a single casualty is taking place because of their excellent management system. So in the, they have prepared a detailed SOP and all the, I mean, their mobilization, their measures, immediate measures, and their permanent measures which they have taken. 
so every almost every quarter they are facing these problems of typhoons and cyclones and they are able to manage excellent way so that is the kind of i mean based on our experience you can set the benchmark and other states also then uh, they are following those kind of uh, experiences which we have the best practices in our own country so that is how i mean in different areas when we see that in particular places in one particular state or province or area where we have best managed the system that may serve as a benchmark for one country for our own states so that is sorry for i mean just missing the point and then uh, yes please get that's fine thank you so so thank you thank you for that that was um really good to to hear that and just wondering if there's any other reflections on that comment or savina's comments on um certification systems and 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 um things like performance measures and scoping and getting things thought out early on in the sort of infrastructure life cycle hi uh, yes thank you uh, may i uh, yes, may please. may i have a comment on the uh, sabrina's comment and uh, i really like the idea of the actually the rating actually uh, it's because the, uh, there is a um, marketing power in this world and uh, it, when it comes to community uh, people usually think about uh, the role of a government you know basically government role a local government as well as the central government however in the reality uh, the private sector or other sectors are also important and also the uh, rating rating uh, could you know um, set the kind of uh, you know uh, direction of a competition of a private sector and we can utilize the, the you know the active power of the private sector in the so called right way uh, toward the uh, you know sustainability i really like the idea thank you david anything for yourself um, for now, uh, I don't have any comment. I totally agree with uh, Mr. Kihara that the business sector plays a very important role in addition to uh, uh, the local government and also academia as well. Yeah, good. good. I'd just like to um, pick up a, from a personal point of view as well on these comments Mr. Nomo and Savina said about benchmarks and, and, and um, being able to build things into standard operating procedures and the like. Um, in fact, I could use this maybe to, 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 to wrap up because we're near, near time. Um, I, I'm thinking that all this fits into this sort of systemic, holistic way of looking at resilience and, and life cycle is important. The earlier we take decisions in infrastructure projects, the easier it is to change and modify. We don't want to try and change the decision once something starts to get built or has been built. We want to get that resilience built in at the scoping stage, at the early stage. And having performance benchmarks, having experience, as Mr. Melwell was saying, uh, to, to, to get people involved from a community point of view very early on, it, it makes it easier to have that involvement and understanding that can give us long-term resilient infrastructure, uh, whether it's from disasters or from increasing prevalence of disasters caused by climate change. These are things we need to think of now. Important keywords. Words I've come up with during this, this session have included things like uh, metrics and decision making capacity. Because if the decision makers don't understand the consequences of their decisions over time, then we maybe failed at the first step. Decisions need to be made in that sort of framework of thinking long term, thinking of uncertainty, and thinking of the communities that we're trying to protect. And standard setting organizations like ISO, um, like national standards bodies have a huge role to play in setting some of these best practice concepts into documentation. Uh, it doesn't have to be a standard that takes three or four years to develop um, that has a lot of mandatory requirements. It could be a guidance note that gives people flexibility. And very often guidance notes can be produced in a short period of time. And if there are existing standards that get in the way of long-term resilience, organizations can choose to be compliant with those standards, but set other thresholds, benchmarks for the longer term. But it goes through the whole of the infrastructure life cycle from design construction right through to the operation of that infrastructure. Now, 
we just got a few seconds left. I'd really like to thank our eminent speakers today, the keynote and the three panelists and, and the discussion we've had. It's been really rich. Thank you all. You deserve a big applause. I have to close the uh, session now and say, have a nice rest of the day, everybody. And it's been an honor to be the moderator here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.